today, I'm joined by Jennifer Patrick Leary, Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior at INSEAD. In this episode, we talk about managing finances as a couple. Managing finances as a couple can be tricky, especially when both of you have vastly different views when it comes to money. Things such as spending, saving, or investing habits can create a lot of tension in relationships. We talk about how you can navigate these issues better. I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, be sure to subscribe and consider leaving us a review and sharing it with your friends. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of In Your Best Interest, your personal finance podcast. I'm your host, Philip Müller, and today we will be chatting about how you should manage your personal finances with your partner. Personal disagreements over financial decision-making are among the main reasons that married couples often end up in divorce court. Unfortunately, even when couples have resources and financial advice readily available to them, they still end up a lot of times fighting over money. There was a survey conducted by Fidelity Investments that found couples carrying debt argued significantly more, 67%, about money than those couples who are not burdened with debt, 41%. So in order to learn more about the topic and get some valuable information as well as advice, I have a great guest join me today. Her name is Jennifer Patrick Leary. Jennifer is an associate professor of organizational behavior at INSEAD. She directs the Executive Education Management Acceleration Program, the Women Leaders Program, and the INSEAD Gender Diversity Program. An award-winning researcher and teacher, she was shortlisted for the Talent Award in 2017 and shortlisted for the Radar New Thinker Award in 2015 by Thinkers50, the ranking of the most influential management authors in the world. She was also included among the world's best 40 business school professors under 40 by Poets and Quants. On top of all of the above, she's also the author of a book entitled Couples That Work, which explores how working couples can thrive both in love as well as in work. Jennifer is a British citizen, and she earned her PhD in organizational behavior from INSEAD. She also holds an MBA from IMD in Switzerland and a Bachelor of Science in Genetics from Nottingham University in the UK. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jennifer. Thanks, it's great to be with you. Yeah, it's great to be with you as well. I think uh, for, for the audience, uh, we've spoken before a little bit. Um, I think I'm very happy to have you uh, join us today to talk about this topic. Uh, I know from, you know from your book as well, both you and your husband are working. You have two children, I heard, right? Yeah. So I think this is the perfect uh, person to speak about how you manage finances with your partner. I think, uh, like I said in my intro, it's a very hotly debated topic. It always comes up when I used to do for 10 years um, personal financial planning, so directly working with um, families together. Um, it's very contentious. Uh, I always try to get everyone in those meetings, even though sometimes the wife or the husband in either way can actually go and says, hey, no, I want you to do it. Uh, I don't really care about finances. Um, but I always try to make sure everyone joins in because I think that's one of the most important pieces to the puzzle. However, before we get into this, uh, we always ask our guests a few personal questions. So if you don't mind, uh, how about you share with us a little bit about, you know, how was life for Jennifer growing up or, you know, maybe how we, I already mentioned where you went to university, but how did, how did it come about where you ended up now? Yeah. So it's interesting. So when I was little, I, I grew up in the middle of England, nowhere near anywhere anyone would ever have heard of. And every summer holiday, I went camping in France with my parents. And now I live in France because INSEAD is a business school based in France. So my parents are like, that's because we came on holiday every year to France. So we're very European culture. And um, I'd always wanted to leave the UK. And so I did my master's in Switzerland and then came to France and have lived in the US and also spent some time in Africa. So very international. And, and my husband is from Sicily. So married internationally as well. So that sense of kind of travel and wanderlust is a big part of who I am. Oh, that's awesome. And because I'm kind of the same way, coming from Germany, I lived in a bunch of countries, uh, ended up in Singapore at the moment. Um, I, I do share a lot of that uh, wanderlust with you there. Um, how do you go about studying a bachelor in genetics and then going into organizational behavior 
um, as a topic. Now, how did you make that change? I, honestly, my bachelor was a bit of a mistake. I think like many 18 year olds, I had no clue what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to go to university, not really for the studying, but for the partying. So I um, actually took the same degree as my mother. My mother is a professor in, in, uh, in biology. And, um, and I had a great time at university. I didn't particularly enjoy my degree. So very quickly after that, transitioned. I actually worked in the business world for six, seven years before doing my MBA and then transitioning into academia in this space. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, and it shows every time I think we have guests on, uh, it's the third in a row, I think, where people did exactly like you. They studied something, they completely went the other way um, later on. And I think it's always a good reminder for listeners, especially the younger audience, that you don't have to have everything perfect the first time around, right? Not even the second or third. <laughs> exactly. But you did say you have uh, you worked in between um, doing your bachelor's and uh, your master's. And since this is a personal finance podcast, I always like to ask, what was your first experience with money? Is there any particular memory or story that you remember perhaps? Uh, you know, maybe your grandparents uh, gave you an allowance or maybe it was like, you know, someone, you know, bought you a stock certificate. It's something like this happened to you at all? Yeah, so I was not brought up in a wealthy family. So stock certificates would certainly never have happened in my childhood. I mean, I remember getting five. I remember actually when I was very young getting 10 pence pocket money every week and on a Friday afternoon we'd stop at the sweet shop in my village and then um, look at what 10 pence could buy me and my favorite was to get um, a, a 10 penny bag of sweets which in those days you could get 20 sweets for tw 10 pence for so that was my earliest budgeting experience oh, it's, a, it's a good one that's how you start to learn right <laughs> Yeah. So, no, that's good. And then what about your first paycheck? Do you remember, if, was there anything like your first proper paycheck? Is, was there anything you specifically bought with that at all? So I've always been a bit of a saver rather than a spender. I tend to save for experiences rather, you know, I don't collect anything. I'm not, a, you know, my brother always bought loads of CDs. That was never me. I was always saving up to go on the next trip. So I think I probably saved most of it with an eye on some trip or other in the summer that was coming up. Yeah, the wanderlust again, right? <laughs> yeah. Great. No, that's good. And then the last question before we go in the topic, I like to always ask is, is there a particular investment where you say, hey, this is the best one I've made? It doesn't have to be, you know, in proper like financial investment, but any kind of investment where you, you know, you look back and you think, hey, this really was the best one I've made. Okay, so this is unusual. So we invested in a pizza oven in our garden. My husband's Italian. And it's the best investment we ever made because now we have every Saturday evening, we have loads of friends over for a pizza party every Saturday. And it's the way we put money to work for our kind of social life and our health and well-being. Best oh, that's, investment. That's ever. awesome, especially also during Corona, right? <laughs> Yeah, spending so much time at home cooking. That's awesome. Yeah, and no, that's a great investment. And it's a very uh, different uh, answer that we've gotten so far. So very good. Very good. Um, so let's go uh, into the topic. And I think um, I, I explained in the in the in the beginning a little bit that managing finances is a very contested topic, right? Especially between partners. Um, I know that, you know, you also wrote a book on how people manage dual careers, um, their lives like that with kids, you know, you know, crossing oceans for jobs, you know, moving for, for the spouses. They all come also with money decisions, right? So I sh I'm sure you've studied this as well. And you, I, you yeah. I think, are a great example of this as well because you and your husband both work. Um, you have children. Um, how about we go back in life a little bit? And because I think there's different stages to managing finances with partners coming from, you know, when you first get to know each other to when you, uh, you know, start dating to becoming in, an, in a relationship and then getting married and then having children. All of these are different life events, right? That, that, that people go through and they all come yeah. with different financial aspects. So wh what, was it, what was it for you? When was the first time that you brought it up with your husband? question I guess when we bought our first house we had our first money conversation but I think you know in my research what I find is that um, money's a little bit of a red herring 
Very often when couples are fighting about money, which they do a lot, as you said, as your statistics showed, they're not really fighting about money. Money is the symptom rather than the cause. What they tend to be fighting about is power, right? Who has the power to decide what our priorities are? And I think it's really the conversations about priorities that make the difference in couples, as opposed to the conversation of, you know, budgeting or how expensive a house we can buy. Um, it's more around, okay, what are our priorities for this house, for this holiday, for this savings? And I think if couples get that right, no matter what stage of life they're at, the money issues are a lot, lot less for them. No, that that makes sense. And I think that's a good way to think about it. So you said it's not so much about the budget or like, you know, how big the house is and you should have an open discussion about expectations, right? Um, yeah. So when it comes to budgeted and decisions though, still, right? You you know, you become, you're singles, you get to know each other, you now start dating. At some point you have that decision, like, you know, both of you are working or not, one person is not working how do you see or how did you go through the budgeting decision? When did you the first time you said, hey, do we have to have a joint account versus an individual account, right? Um, do we, uh, you know, pool our money to pay rent together or who makes those decisions uh, for you guys or when, when you went through this? Yeah, so we, right from day one, we had a joint account. Like money has never been a particular bone of contention for us. And I think it's because, firstly, both of us are huge savers rather than spenders. So as your survey showed, we've never really been in debt, apart from, obviously, the mortgage for the house. Um, so, in fact, we've never, ever been in debt, apart from the mortgage for the house. And so I think what we have is some alignment, which is just so important across all couples. It's, it's alignment that really saves you, I think. I mean, I don't think every couple needs to be savers. There's certainly loads of spenders out there who are happy, but it's about are you aligned with your partner? And I think we just were quite naturally aligned from the get-go. You know, we were both savers. We weren't particularly um, uh, kind of proprietary around our money. We were happy to chuck it all in one bank account and, um, and just manage it how we did. So then basically when couples you know, are not online, right? Like people are not uh, on the same page, for example. And, yeah. uh, you know, one person splurges on something that the other one doesn't agree with. So how, how should couples deal with this? Because it's like, it's always, that that's when contentious things happen, right? Is there anything from, from your uh, background that you can, you know, maybe give some advice or like from the research that you've done uh, where people can make changes to their habits or that those kind of things? Yeah, I mean, when I think about finances in couples, I really think of finances on two levels. There's the big decisions, the what house to buy, what car, the investments, the pensions, these decisions that make a big difference in your life, right, in the long term. And then there's the little things, right? Does your partner go out and spend double on a bottle of wine than you would spend on? Which is a slightly different category. So let me start with the big ticket items first. You know, what I find is the... the The, the conflict around that in couples really comes from two things. The first is not agreeing what your priorities are. So let's take the house decision, right? Is your priority to have the absolute dream house at any cost because that's really important to you? Or is your priority having a good enough place that's not going to stretch your budget too much so you can still kind of go on holidays and save? Very different priorities, completely acceptable priorities. But if you have different priorities to start off, you're going to have a lot of arguments around what house to buy and how much budget to stretch. You know, same with like, let's take risk on um, on investments. Some people are just a lot more cautious than others. And you'll know this from being, you know, a financial advisor. You, you, some people will are very happy to play the market And other people want to be in bonds and things like this. Again, that can cause a lot of tension if one person in a couple is, has got a much higher risk profile than another. And so what I found in my research is couples who, who just naturally are a little bit different, maybe they have different risk profiles, they have different priorities. What's really important for them is to kind of find some middle ground before they get to the decision. So before they're at the estate agent looking at properties or before they're sat down with the financial advisor, 
together, that they just sit down and think, okay, what is our combined, you know, strategy or our combined goal? And oftentimes when couples are a little bit far apart, they just need to find some middle ground, right? So, I mean, let's think risk profile. If one of you has sort of put it all under the mattress and the other is invested in penny shares, you know, there's somewhere in the middle around where both of you feel a bit stretched, but neither of you is too stretched. The same with the house, et cetera. And what I find is that when couples can set those priorities in advance, the investment decisions go a lot better. But then there's these little things, right? The how much did you spend on a bottle of wine or you just went on a shopping trip and blew X hundred dollars on a dress or whatever it is. I think part of it in couples, assuming people are not spending beyond their means, is us letting go. So I think very often in a couple, we would want our partner to make exactly the same decisions we would make. But that's not real, right? That's not real life. The reason we fall in love with our partner is they're a bit different from us and that attracts us to them. And so I think for these little things, it's really important that to a certain extent, couples just let it go. Unless, of course, it's materially affecting their family, you know, obviously if we're going into debt or it's stopping the family doing other things. But if it's a case of spending that bit more on, you know, a holiday or a piece of clothing or something than you would have done, I think we all need to learn to just let those little things go for greater harmony in the relationship. Yeah, those little things can can really uh, ruin a lot, right? If, if you keep harnessing, like always coming back to those little things and say, hey, I don't want you to spend this. Or you get upset about it and don't say anything to your partner as well, right? Yeah. So that they don't even yeah. know. So. How would you then say if one person is more, you know, keen on doing your finances, like, for example, I said before, hey, I, I like to I like I actually enjoy doing it. Right. And your partner doesn't enjoy doing it. But yeah, it's still kind of there's problems can still arise in that shit situation. Right. So one person takes charge then the other person is not much involved. And then over time, they feel like kind of left out. Right. Is that something that you've seen as well? Or is there any way um, to, to overcome that? Yeah, so it's interesting. So what the research will tell us on um, like the division of household tasks, because managing finance is essentially a household task. What the research tells us is the best strategy for couples, and this really counts across the board, is a divide and conquer strategy. So one of you take care of financing, one of you take care of, you know, the kids' school stuff, one of you take care of this one. So you each have your domain. Um, and the reason that works so well in couples is essentially we all live really busy lives. And if we have to think constantly about all these different domains, it's just too much for us. So in general, that divide and conquer where one of you takes the lead is, is research shows us the best strategy you can have. However, that does not mean that you take the lead and do everything and never communicate and never share. I think the issue comes when... Um, the communication breaks down. So suddenly after two years, your partner looks at the investment portfolio and is like, ah, you know, how did this happen? How did we get in this situation? So I think there's a difference between being in charge and taking the lead and not communicating much. And you can relate it to a different area of life. I mean, let's imagine you have kids and um, one of you takes the lead on organizing the school stuff. It would be pretty weird for you never ever to discuss your children's schooling, right? You, you, kind of can't really imagine that happening. And it's the same thing with finances. It's great if one of you takes the lead, but you should still keep that an ongoing conversation. You know, just so you know, I'm going to invest in this or, you know, I'm thinking about doing that. So it's about the, your partner feeling included, I think, as it goes along. Yeah, even if they're not necessarily 100% you know, interested in the topic, I think overall it gives them also the feeling of safety right hey this is how much we have this is what we have to to work with right so they're also it's also expectation setting then on what you can afford going forward as well right and quite frankly i think this is a topic where it has also long-term effects what if the person who's managed the finances for such a long time also you know something happens to them they pass away or something and now you have to you know just do it right or you have to deal with it so um from 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 your background, have you thought about this? Have you talked to people through your research on you know when they haven't necessarily been in charge and you know some, something happened to the other person managing that ta specific task and how they dealt with it? Yeah, I mean, I think you know as 
anyone knows who who's lost someone close to them, whether that's their partner or or a parent or something, the the admin, like the financial admin, can be the biggest headache. Um, just unraveling it all and trying to work out what's going on, and um, and also discovering what you actually have. And in fact, I was talking to a woman whose husband had, had very sadly passed away very suddenly. And, um, and he'd always managed all the finances. And of course, first of all, she's dealing with grief. So the last thing she wants to do is get into Excel spreadsheets. Yep. But, you know, she has to do this to close accounts. And she realized that they actually had a lot more money than she realized. And her husband had been a real saver. And, um, and they'd not lived a poor life. You know, they'd lived a, a good middle class life, but they'd not really gone out and she'd always had these dreams of going places with him you know visiting places but you know they'd never gone because you know they were budgeting and stuff and she she felt an incredible amount of regret when she saw this money and thinking my god the experiences we could have had together that now we can't because he's passed away but I just never knew and so I think it's not just the practical kind of what are the account numbers and how do I access the accounts and all that I think it's the feeling of, you know, I, I never realized, you know, I never quite understood where we were and what we could have done or what our constraints were. That's um, in some ways more distressing than the practical getting in touch with the banks and, and you know, informing people and changing cards and that level. No, I think I think you're right. And I think the two things that I wanted to get back to on that was first one, the it's definitely um the how to manage through if you're already grieving right you don't want to deal with the different uh things in life and i do we do a weekly almost weekly financial planning uh webinars now or seminars we used to do um so we with hundreds and hundreds of people thousands of people over the last three years and every time i ask the question i go through you know the financial planning tools and you know we walk them through you know work talking about life goals and things like that but then I also talk about financial plan B. Do you have one, right? What happens if the unexpected yeah. happens? And I, the first thing I ask, how many people in the room have a will? And I'm telling yeah. you, it is maximum 10%. Maximum 10%. Yeah. There is probably another 70% that have thought about it, but they never actually yeah. do it. Or they have it on their list of things to do, but it's something that you just put off, right? Oh, I'm young. Oh, I have this. I have this. I have this going on in life. And this is what you said before, right? Uh, life is busy, <laughs> especially also when you're yeah. in a dual household and you have children, right? The last thing on your mind is personal finances and um, also use, doing a will. But a will is really, really an important piece of a financial plan. And I think it helps exactly in this situation because you actually talk to each other. You talked about, hey, what is important to us? What should we, you know, what should go to... What person? Who should take care of our children if something happens to us, right? Where are the accounts? Are they listed all together somewhere? So I think that's a very, very important thing. Have, have, have you, um, first of all, uh, I know this is more personal, but have you done a will or is this something you've, you've, you've thought about before? Because I get this literally, like I said, 10% of the people have done it. I think coming to your grieving thing and, you know, was, yeah. was quite important. <laughs> We're unusual because in France, you actually don't have a choice where your money goes. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's an automatic division of money okay. in France. And you only write a will if you disagree with that division. That's something but the new. Division, the division, I think most people would pick in their will, which is, you know, if your partner survives, they get it. And if neither of you survive, your children split it exactly, you know, between the number of children. So in France, you know, everything's regulated in France, including what happens when you die. <laughs> and, and in fact, in France, it's, you only need to make a will if you are, for some reason, contesting that, that division, which we would never do. But we did check it out when we first got to France, when we first had children. The first, one of the first things we thought about was writing a will, but we went to see our lawyer and they were like, there's no need to write one in France because you don't have a choice. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good. That's good to know. I never, I haven't even known this that in the in France it's not possible. I we actually have one in Singapore, Germany, England, and the U.S. Um, because some, wow. uh, if depending on the different, because we have assets in different places, because we lived in yeah. these different places for quite some time, so it becomes quite difficult, right? Because, uh, but it makes life a lot easier. I tell people, hey, you've written it down. There is also no yeah. fighting in the family afterwards. Who I always say this example. You probably know someone someone's or you know remote family that now the kids are not speaking to each other anymore 
because there was no will or there was a will, but it was never explained to them why the parents thought this is the way it should be split up, right? Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a quite interesting topic. But the other one you mentioned was the regret, right? And there was, they didn't talk about like goals. Maybe she didn't express the goals that she had, right? To her husband and, you know, he was, she was obviously then surprised. So how, how would, how would you say people could deal with this better? Like, you know, managing goals and expectations in that relationship then? Yeah. I mean, I think, and I think this conversation is not just about finances, although finance yep. is part of it. I mean, I always suggest to couples at least once a year, they should be sitting down and thinking about, and different people call this different things, right? Goals, ambitions, values. It doesn't matter what you call it but if you think of a five-year time span and the reason I say five years is it's long enough that the decisions we make now are quite consequential in five years but it's not kind of it's very hard to project ourselves 15 years forward like who knows what's going to happen in 15 years but I always suggest we sit down once a year and think okay in the next five years what are the things we're aiming for and that might be financially you know do we really want to try hard to pay off our mortgage or are we, are we trying to save a certain amount of money or whatever? Also professionally, because of course our professional goals have a huge impact on our financial goals, depending on, you know, let's say one of us wants to make a big career transition. You know, then maybe the next two or three years we need to save like crazy to pay for that transition or if one of us wants to go into entrepreneurship. So I always suggest discussing these things holistically, like our financial goals, our career goals, and also maybe our personal goals. Um, because when you have this full picture, then you can really make mindful decisions going forward. You know, and I think one of the huge benefits for people being in a working couple where both people earn money, even if they don't earn exactly the same amount of money, is you can buy yourself a little bit of freedom, right? If, if one of you is the breadwinner and one of you is really taking care of the home, I mean, that's a great arrangement, but you're a little bit locked in those roles. It's very difficult for the breadwinner winner to say, okay, I'm going to take a sabbatical and reorient my career because you know, who's going to earn the money? Mm. But the great thing about being in a working couple is you have some wiggle room. And so really thinking of these things holistically, not just the finances, but what are we saving for? What is this money going to give us the option to do? is really good because it also helps our motivations because there are always times of year, you know, like Christmas is not that far away. And um, it's always easy to blow our budget at times like that. And yet if we have this goal in mind, okay, the reason we're saving this much a month is because, you know, we really want to have a go at entrepreneurship in two years time, or we want to take a three month sabbatical in two years time just to travel a bit while the kids are still young. It makes it a lot easier to stick to our financial goals. Yeah, and I think that good points. Uh, I always preach to people, uh, and something I do myself with my wife is, we also set these goals, right? We have three, five, uh, ten, and fifteen. I know fifteen is hard, and it changes all the time, but it's a good idea to yeah. like once a year think about those things, right? So we actually just once a year we look back. Hey, how much did we? How 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 is our plan going? Right? Are we tracking? Are we not tracking? Do we need to make some changes? Right. Um, you know, maybe also, like you said, the breadwinner, maybe they get burned out from working so much, too. Right. And they want to make a change, but they cannot. Right. Um, but yeah. you can plan for these things a lot better if you talk openly about them and manage them. And then it gives you also, like you said, you have these shorter term goals as well, because these long goals like retirement or kids is college and, you know, or maybe buying a, a vacation home somewhere. They're very big goals, right? They take a lot of effort yeah. and a lot of perseverance to get to. So having some things along the way to cross off helps a lot to 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 actually get to the longer term goals as well. So exactly. And I think you know what what this period with COVID has taught us is you can plan all you like and you never quite know what's going to happen. Um, and I think, you know, many people now are facing job uncertainty or maybe they've already been laid off and they're looking for the next thing. And so having had a set of really robust financial goals beforehand has hopefully given people a buffer to work through this period. Oh, absolutely. And I think COVID also changed priorities of people when it comes to, you know, jobs, work, uh, earning money and things quite a bit, right? Because the, when when you're like freedom is not taken away, but like, compromised and uh, you know you can't do the things that you are used to it it makes people really question you know life i think this year was a really big year to reflect 
Um, I actually have a friend of mine in the US. He just told me uh, two days ago that both him and his wife are actually going to quit their job now. And they're going to take, yeah. they bought an RV and they're going to go on a road trip through the United States for the next 12 months. Because they said, hey, look, it's, yeah. you know, life is short. I, I think it has something to do. I think someone in his family passed away also this summer. Uh, but it, yeah. I think it made you realize, hey, look, this is precious, right? In, and he's in finance yeah. as well. I know he saved a lot. So I, 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 he's the last one that would probably splurge on or say, hey, like uproot their life like this, right? Both really good jobs, no kids yet. But, you know, like it's a big step still for someone, especially if they're in their mind, they're more savers, right? Because now you're drawing down savings. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. That's that's definitely uh, that's definitely one of those things. So we talked about a quite a lot of things, but one thing you mentioned uh, also when you talked about um, the lady losing her husband and he was managing the finances. How do you think about using, um, you know, estate planning lawyers or maybe a financial advisor um, to work, especially for dual couples, right? When both really work hard, and I mentioned this earlier. Financial planning takes a take does take some effort. I try to tell people, hey, you can get an easy financial plan done, and then you can automate as much as possible. But how do you see bringing in help for that relationship? So I think it's a very individual thing. You know, some people have a lot more financial literacy than others. I certainly think it's worth seeking advice now, whether that's kind of paying privately or whether that's getting some good books or magazines to. Um, you know, to teach yourself a little bit. I certainly think it's worth doing that at the beginning and perhaps every, you know, every few years to, you know, do almost do a financial health check with somebody. But I think, you know, many people now are pretty financially literate and um, and can do a fairly decent job on their own. But I think it's a real personal preference thing. Some people are, I know uh, my husband and I are much more obsessed about managing it ourselves, and other people, you know, want to outsource it. I think that's quite a personal choice. But I think certainly everyone should take some advice at the beginning of the journey to really understand, you know, what are the various instruments, for example, they can invest in, et cetera. So they're going in with open eyes. Yes, and I, you mentioned that there's so much uh, resources available with the internet nowadays. Uh, there's podcasts, there is, uh, you know, videos, um, blogs, where people can learn so much about it. So you're not just, you know, if you really want to learn, you can. And I think that's, exactly. a, that's a very important, uh, important leveler, playing field leveler going forward as, as well. Because I think one of my big things is that I always tell clients is that you're your biggest advocate no matter what the advisor says and i'm a financial advisor a financial planner before right it's your money the person who is going to be the most uh fierce of protecting that is yourself so i think you should you know think about yourself as your own personal cfo and that makes them you know then think about it like you would do at work right gets people to think about it a little bit more so jennifer to close it up i think we talked a lot about great things of managing finance with your partner. Are there any tools or like um, research that people can find online um, that you use maybe um, to get better at managing finances together or talk to their um, spouse better about these things? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you say. For me, it's not about tools per se, as in spreadsheets, et cetera. It's really around learning how to talk better about these things and how to... Um, have those conversations, which can sometimes feel a bit awkward to, to, for people to talk about money and especially when it comes to the will and death and what do we want to happen afterwards, etc. So I think it's really important people focus on increasing their ability to have these conversations and then it'll be much easier for them to do the financial planning. And, you know, in my book, a lot of what I focus on is the conversations we need to have and things from the Gottman Institute, there's lots of resources out there to help us think through how do we have these conversations. So it's more of advice of how to do this stuff as opposed to what exactly to do. Because I think that varies so much by people's personal situations um, that it's very much a personal decision. No, oh, absolutely. I think those are all good, good resources to look up to. I think we can put them also in the show notes. Uh, of the episode so then people can find that um, 
from your side um, before we close it up is there a way to find out more about your book or where can is it available already can you get it anywhere in the world yeah you can get it anywhere in the world and the best place to look is on my website um which i guess you might pop on the show notes yeah we can definitely do that um so we will have that as a link available to everyone that's interested to learn more uh, about jennifer's book and also more of those researches on this topic as always um, thank you all for listening so much um, and we'll be back with you with another episode soon thank you again jennifer for taking the time to be with us today as well Thanks so much. Bye. That's it for the show this week. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, subscribe and leave us a review. The reviews really help us and we love reading your comments as well. In Your Best Interest is hosted by me, Philip Müller. We're produced by Stashaway and we're mixed by Mo Ramley. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we have new content out for you. Also, don't forget to download the StashAway app. It's available in the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So you can start on your financial journey right now.